I'm gonna read from this joint, which came out last week, but also um, a book of poems that came out last week was a book, Dunce, by the great poet Mary Ruffel. And I, I read it yesterday and I love it so much. And if y'all indulge me, I wanna open up with one of my favorite poems from that book. Um, this poem is called The Good Fortune. I, and I usually have the book with me, but I left it at home. Um, this poem is called The Good Fortune of Material Existence. Without bringing any more people into the planning loop, I have decided to have breakfast. <laughs> I have made cautious inquiries and finally learned it is Thursday. <laughs> My attention sets out in a cheerful mood on a memorable expedition to the sink. Oh, blank and hopeless days. Oh, long sleepless nights. They are forgotten now as I turn on the cold, clear water of the stream all the rivers of the world convene in me. They rush over my hands. They enter my mouth. They cover my face. I am compelled to drink my own tears, as you too will be when you wake. Thanks for letting me read that poem and bring Mary Ruffel into the room. Yeah, we'll buy that book. Yeah, by It's really beautiful. Um, and I think sometimes as poets, when our books come out, we kind of get wrapped up in the fact that our book is out, and I to sit with that book was really humbling. Now I'm going to read some of my poems, if that's cool. <laughs> but by, by Mary Riffle's book. This poem is called The Prestige. The poem begins not where the knife enters, but where the blade twists. Some wounds cannot be hushed no matter the way one writes of blood and what reflection arrives in its pooling. The poem begins with pain as a mirror, inside of which I adjust a tie the way my father taught me before my first funeral. And so the poem begins with old grief again at my neck. On the radio, a singer born in a place where children watch the sky for bombs, is trying to sell me on love as something akin to war, and I have no lie to offer as treacherous as this one. I was most like the bullet when I viewed the body as a door, but I'm past that now. No one will bury their kin when desire becomes a fugitive between us. There will be no folded flag at the doorstep. A person only gets to be called a widow once, and then they are simply lonely. The bluest period. Gratitude not for love itself, but for the way it can end without a house on fire. This is how I plan to leave next. Unceremonious as birth in a country overrun by the ungrateful living. The poem begins with a chain of well-meaning liars walking one by one off the earth's edge. That's who died and made me king. Who died and made you? You don't have to like snap. Here's, here's the only rule I'm going to impart. Either like agree on something, but it can't be like half snapping and half silence. <laughs> so as a unit, agree on something after the poems or nothing after the poems. <laughs> I'm fine with either. But if you are feeling moved to like applaud or, or snap, feel free to. But we can't do this thing where it's like six people snapping and then everyone else is like, I don't know how to snap. <laughs> anyway, here's another poem. Um, I lived in New Haven, Connecticut for two and a half years and did not enjoy it. <laughs> <clears throat> and one night, and one Friday night in New Haven, the pizza places, New Haven's known for pizza um, and liberal racism, but pizza too. Um, and a shout out to anyone. Is anyone here from Connecticut? Okay, well. You're not wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, but it's also known for pizza. And there was one night in Connecticut where due to like a delivery mishap, 
in New, on the way to New Haven, all the pizza places ran out of cheese and they kind of like systemically closed down except for the one I lived above, which opted to attempt to stay open and sell some kind of like crust sauce situation, which did not go well. And the woman, there was a woman who like ordered a pizza and did not get cheese and was not having it in a fight, an argument ensued. So this is about the night in Connecticut where pizza places ran out of cheese, but it is also about my divorce. <laughs> The cheese is a metaphor, if you're <laughs> looking in that. From the humid brick building below my humid brick building, a woman bellows at the pizza man who, it seems, threw no cheese atop the crust in its red river of sauce because, as he shouts above the sirens of State Street and the growing crowd lined outside his shop, it is Friday, and he is woefully short on mozzarella. And there are far better pizza options on every corner of this city overpriced and tonight bursting at the seams with lonely people who will seek the warmth spilling from the edges of a cardboard box and onto their laps and into their fingers on the walk back to a newly empty apartment. I love the heat for how it separates the desire for touch from the practicality of it. If it gets too hot for love, as it did for Mookie and Tina, then we're all on our own sinking islands anyway. There is no cheese in this town anymore. And what could be worse than the fraction of a dream behind every door you crawl to? It is Friday, and surely some of my people are praising the fresh coin in their bank accounts. And what a tragedy to spend it on a half-finished freedom. And the argument below has poured out into the streets and the waiting masses. And I imagine this is no longer over cheese, but over every mode of unfulfilled promise. The cluster of sins still stuck to a body fresh from the waters of baptism. The parent who must dig a grave for their youngest child. From below, a man yells, there are only three ingredients. You can't even get that right. <laughs> and isn't it funny to vow you will love someone until you are dead? We've chosen silence. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, here's another Connecticut poem about Dogs. You know what? No, I'm going to read this um, sad poem about Michael Jordan and my mom. What's funny is I think um, I'm very, I'm very, very, especially I, if anyone's ever heard me read before, you know, so I'm like vehemently against explanation. But because there's like a generation gap, does everyone know that in the 98 NBA Finals, the Bulls beat the Utah Jazz? because Michael Jordan hit a game winning shot that he pushed off, he like pushed someone to get space. Okay. That, if you didn't know, I just literally explained to you what happened, so. <laughs> it is maybe time to admit that Michael Jordan definitely pushed off. That one time in the 98 NBA Finals, and in praise of one man's hand on the waist of another's, and in praise of the ways we guide our ships to the shore of some brief and gilded mercy, I touch my fingers to the hips of this vast and immovable sadness and push once more. And who is to say, really, how much weight was behind Jordan's palm on that night in Utah? And on that same night, one year earlier, the paramedics pulled my drowning mother from the sheets where she slept and they said it must have felt like a whole hand was pushing down on her lungs. And I spent the summer holding my breath in bed until the small black spots danced on the ceiling. And I am sorry that there is no way to describe this that is not about agony or that is not about someone being torn from the perch of their comfort. And on the same night, a year before my mother died, Jordan wept on the floor of the United Center locker room after winning another title because it was Father's Day and his father went to sleep on the side of a road in 93 and woke up a ghost. And there is no moment worth falling to our knees and galloping towards like the one that sings our dead back into the architecture. And so yes, for a moment in 1998, Michael Jordan made what space he could on the path between him and his father's small and breathing grace. And so yes, there is an ocean between us, the length of my arm, and I have built nothing for you that can survive it. And from here, I am close enough to be seen but not close enough to be cherished. And from here, I can see every possible ending before we even touch. I'm going to read a few poems that have um, the same title. 
How can black people write about flowers at a time like this? Maybe all the blues requires is a door through which a person can enter and exit. Every god hides their eyes behind a blue hood. The hooded devil waiting at the crossroads couldn't give a fuck about the women who sent a man wailing with a, with a guitar case on his back. It isn't loneliness if enough tongues have your chorus jumping from underneath their hooded ruckus. Maybe all the blues requires is a person who has been touched before in a caravan of hands busy with their own pleasures. If you can't fashion a song out of that, there is no God or devil that could make something of your soul anyway. A father stands over his crying son and hisses, I'll give you something to cry about, as if he didn't already bring a child into a world that requires neither of them. How can black people write about flowers at a time like this? Drake said, y'all better not come to my funeral with that fake shit. <laughs> and this is how I knew he'd never slept on a floor by way of his loneliness and empty pockets. What is neither here nor there is that I cling to the past because in it I had yet to know pain and therefore I was held only by that which desired my boyish appetites. We buried Tyler. And the violets I placed on his grave were plastic and cost $4.99 at the corner store by the punk house where we had cake on his 19th birthday and there were purple heart-shaped petals iced into the corner of it. And I am saying that I would not know a real violet if I ran my hands across what I imagine is its silk jaw. I would not know even if you pulled a string of them from your pockets and gently placed, planted the string along my neck and said someone not here thought this would look pretty on you. Friends, the trick to this one is that I laid the plastic on the grave I least wanted to dig. Death itself, that fake shit I stay praying to show up somewhere. How can black people write about flat? Well, should I read another one of these? I'll read one more of these. How can black, there's like 18 of them in this book, which is... How can black people write about flowers at a time like this? But if you'll indulge my worst impulses, isn't it funny how the white petals of the oleander do not render the crow flightless upon being swallowed, and yet the human body crumbles under the weight of their softness? By funny, you may think the joke is about the black thing consuming a bouquet of whiteness without falling from the sky in droves, but by funny, I mean I am adorning my fingertips with white petals and running a thumb along the edges of your mouth, agape with a rapturous desire. To hoard desire is one way of becoming a fiend. My homie peddled white to fiends who took the white peddled into themselves, and some did not survive, but some, I imagine, grew brief black wings. Having never felt it, I will still wish upon you the feeling of knowing exactly where your next high will be born from. I do not define the distance between sinning and deliverance. I pedaled the white bike downtown on a Tuesday. The homie got 15 for hoarding the white he had yet to pedal inside of a suitcase. His mother cried in the courtroom, mad perhaps with a sudden descent of feathers. I'm going to read a new poem that's not in that book. Because I think there's something really exciting about um, the first poem you write when you're done with a project. Because I think for poets who have written projects, sometimes when you're done with some shit, it feels like you're never going to write a poem again. And so um, I owe this to every year I teach at Kenyon College. I have like a young writers program. And every year I teach there and I write with them. We do the prompts together. And they like edit. My, they don't edit each other because I feel like teenagers editing each other's work is like a Teenagers who like don't know each other. You know what I mean? Like that's a slippery ass slope. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> one wrong bit of feedback and it's like, all right, well. I got to break up a fight now, you know? <laughs> so they don't edit each other's work, but I have them edit my work because I think they're hungry for that kind of engagement, you know? Um, and so they edited this poem and gave the prompt was, you have to write a list of like tangible and intangible things that define you and then write a poem about one of those things. And I had my list all ready to go. And one of them, after knowing me for like three days, one of them was like, hey, you always wear a hat. And that's not on your list. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, way to call me out, Samantha. Um, and so I started playing with, um, in my poems, I play with language and slang a lot. Um, and so I started playing with the idea of the phrase, no cap. So this poem is called No Cap. 
The old head strokes the winding forest of gray cascading to cover the wrinkles sketched into the sides of his face by the uneven desires of time. And he asks me what on earth the kids down the block mean when they rattle the summer puddles with their laughter and slap hands at the end of a good ass story and yell, no cap. And I admit I did find a single gray curling a cruel finger out the depths of my beard's otherwise darkness, but I still know the gospel tucked underneath slang leaping from even the most decorated tongue and this is meant to say come closer to say i have nothing left to hide even with a congregation of the most fashionable shade i would never lie to you as i lied to my father at 16 with chris bills lining my pocket as he searched the house for the grocery money he left on the table the night before no cap i would not betray you now as my father's own hairline betrays him retreating to the shadows from which it was born his dome a nation with no capital but still Still glistening with any season. Say no cap and mean you will stand at attention for your own undoing. The percussion of the knee's interior and the bed that grows harder to get out of and the lover who is no longer beside you in it. The news says everything is receding. The ice caps will eventually be what swallows the living. A long braid of heat. No cap. Dear friends, the moment for deceptions has long passed and so it must be said. I praise the thick hair that once coiled high on the crown of my mother, and I praise the ancestor who tore handfuls of his burly and blooming afro out at my mother's funeral, littering a procession of discarded black wool in front of the open casket and howling his way towards madness. I praise my barber who tilts my head towards the sunlight, coughing its way in the barbershop window. I praise my barber whispering, you've got a hairline I would kill for with a blade to the edge of my temple. Praise the cap cocked backwards and bowing towards the drowning earth, even even on days my cut looks too good to conceal. I would not lie to you about this. Praise that I've never loved anyone enough to unravel the blessing of my own hair upon their leaving. All right, I'm gonna read one more thing, um, but it's kind of long. It's from a nonfiction project that I'm working on that's currently being edited. And so it probably won't sound like this when, uh... <laughs> but I'm, I'm writing a project that's coming out in 2021 about the various modes of black performance throughout US history. So it's about, sure, it's about like minstrel shows and blackface, but it's also about spades. And it's also about the fact that Whitney Houston could not dance. And it's also about <laughs> magicians. It, it's all these things that are kind of, um, that have kind of intersected and had me thinking about, this is a, this is a long explanation that I won't go into. The thing about minstrel shows that I think no one talks about is that for, for some of those black performers, to perform was a type of freedom, right? Yes, they had to paint their face and degrade themselves, but so many of them were ex-slaves or the children of slaves or were born into slavery. And to execute those performances was a way of untethering themselves from bondage, even though the gaze was overwhelmingly white. And so I kind of started to write myself towards understanding the way that I perform with my people that is not for any consumption, right? And so like, when I write about spades, I'm writing about it, me and my homies playing it in a car where no one is watching but us, right? And what kind of love can be fostered out of um, the absence of a gaze at all? What kind of love can be fostered when our gaze is our own? That kind of thing. Um, now that I've described the spades thing, I should read the spades thing. <laughs> but um, I think I'm gonna read a thing about magic. No, I'm gonna read a thing about space. Um, I'm gonna read a thing about space. I'm gonna read several parts of this kind of, kind of essay, long form essay about um, various black people in space that was born out of me remembering that when I was a kid, my childhood best friend's dad insisted that Chewbacca was black. Oh. And so I grew up assuming, like not by grew up, I mean like, I don't know, five years ago, I was like, did anyone else think that Chewbacca was black? And everyone was like, no. <laughs> anyway, this is from a piece called A Few Considerations of Black People in Space. To be fair, I cannot claim that I love the moon as much, all, as, much as all my pals and ancestors and peers. 
I maybe do not love the moon as much as other poets who seem to love the moon for what it is capable of doing to the waters or how it seduces the best or worst out of an astrological sign. I don't know much about astrology, but I do like the idea of astrology for what it brings out in my most creative and magically inclined friends. Alyssa, leaning eagerly over a table to ask me if I know the exact hour and minute of my birth so that we might do my birth chart and finally get down to the, ex to the issue of what's going on with all my emotional rattling about. Madison, scrolling furiously through her phone over a dinner to see what phase the moon is in or what the planet, what planets are twirling ever maniacally out of whack so that she might explain to me why all the furniture in my heart's most precious corners has been upturned. Still, I can't say how much into what it all means, just that it means something, that we were all born under a different moon in a different sign. And I believe in it, I think. I have taken to waving a dismissive hand and telling friends that's such a Virgo thing to say, even when I'm not entirely sure what I mean. And no one has corrected me yet. <laughs> so either I'm right or I've surrounded myself with immensely kind people, which is probably a very Scorpio thing to say. <laughs> but Robert Hayden loved the moon. And what a fool I would be to not love what Robert Hayden loved would be a whole fool to not drink from whatever his palms offered. And Robert Hayden so loved the moon that he decided to strip it of all its magic until it was just the hanging and cratered glowing rock tasked with dividing up the darkness. And I, too, dig the moon most when it is, when it is a question of its functions. How, for example, I might have once leaned into it in some alley on a clear night to better see the face of a dear brother or to skim a phone number scrawled onto a napkin after spilling out of some dive. I wish to view the moon as Hayden viewed the moon, an object that has a purpose rooted primarily in how it shines and little more beyond that. But still, I know that black people in this country have long been obligated to a love for the moon, especially the enslaved who had to traverse the otherwise darkness in a search for freedom, aligning directions with the way the moon fell and following the shapes of the stars. And so I do get the affection for the thing, even if it is sometimes a bit of a show off, every now and again puffing itself wide and sometimes blushing a gentle red, dragging me out of the house or interrupting a romantic movie night, bending in the potential for more romance so that we can all go outside and stare. Then again, who am I to judge? I picked through my own closet and opted for the crushed velvet or the bright red on a day where I am dressing for someone else's wedding. I've showed up to the high school reunion in sneakers that have cost more than I made in a week of work at a job slinging books. So I suppose we're all the moon sometimes times, depending on the occasion. While we're here, though, I have to say that I also know nothing of the stars, but have lied about what I know many times. On the television once, a boy traced the freckles of a girl and then pointed at the sky, and she gasped with joy. On a walk in my real life, holding hands with someone somewhere, I pointed up at the stars and pretended to know the shapes of them and said something about eyes and a future and the person I was with laughed. So OK, I suppose I don't know the stars well enough to lie about them comfortably, but I had a telescope once, bursting out of my top floor window during a time when I lived in a city that got less clogged with a smoky haze during its nighttime hours, and I would look into it every now and then, searching for all the shapes that everyone else saw, but with no luck. From under a campfire, my friend Corinne said, it's easy, the Big Dipper is right above us, and then she traced it out with her finger. But all I saw was a series of tiny explosions that never vanished. Section two. <laughs> Sorry, I, I feel like whenever I finish that first part, people start clapping and then I have to explain anyway. And look, I am certainly not one to project blackness onto the fictional or cartoonishly ambiguous. And Lord knows, I don't want to upset the teeming masses of loud and affectionate Star Wars devotees. But it must be said that I, I, that I as a kid, had a sneaking suspicion that Chewbacca might have been black, what with all the brown that hung from his body, but also the way my pal's dad would shout at the screen when Star Wars was on about how those white folks who made the movie were trying to pull one over, making the a tall and incoherent beast, obviously black. And I don't know if I bought that as much as I bought the idea that so many of the black people I knew would shout about all their woes, but no one would seem to understand what they were saying. Octavia Butler was born to a maid and a man who shined shoes. 
Her father died when she was seven, which left her to be raised by her mother, who she accompanied to work, entering the back doors of white people's houses that needed cleaning. When she was 10, she begged her mother for a typewriter as a way to isolate herself from her peers. Butler was shy and awkward and suffered with schoolwork due to dyslexia. She escaped in books and film, most notably the television version of The Devil Girl from Mars, which was released in 1954 and depicted a female alien commander descending on... It's funny, I don't know if anyone has ever seen this movie, but it's funny because like this would never get made today. <laughs> Depicted a female alien commander descending on London in order to bring men from Earth back to her planet, where the men had been decimated by a gender war, making the planet's rates of reproduction drop significantly. <laughs> I feel like if this were made today, it'd be like, I think we're cool, we're just fine up here with no men. <laughs> Butler, at 12, imagined she could write a better story than this one. And 26 years later, she released Pattern Master, her first novel. In it, humanity is divided by the physically and mentally dominant patternists, the clayarchs who are mutated humans suffering from an extraterrestrial disease, and a group of enslaved humans who could not speak. Pattern Master in the Patternist series that followed, sits among my favorite of Butler's work because it is where she was most reckless in her attempt to see beyond the characters, beyond the landscape she was building, and beyond her own imagination, no doubt whirling with thoughts of the unknown outer darkness. It is a book, like so many of her books, trying to get to the heart of social and class divisions, kicking around the basic questions of what keeps humans apart and what is the responsibility of those in power. These were the questions far older than Butler's time on this planet, which perhaps explains why she had to dream up new worlds in an attempt to find an answer for them. Butler once said, there is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. I hope somewhere she has felt the warmth of each one. This section has like a pretty intense description of uh, astronauts dying in an, a spaceship. So if that is, I don't know. I read this section once and someone was like, that was horrific. So just warning you. Um, yeah, pretty intense descriptions of astronauts. Dying. But is anyone here like studying to be an astronaut? No? Okay, then you're fine. As long as none of you are planning to go to space. I suppose I should invite a few of the blacks who actually did make that wild and glorious trip, not in a film or in an outfit or at the expanse of my own imagination. Mae Jemison got up there to space and then came back down to Earth just in time to get on the episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. It took five whole black astronauts going to space before any of them actually walked on the moon. Bernard A. Harris Jr. touched his feet to the White Rock in 95, years after the dance move had been popularized. Ain't that some shit. It was all a dream until it wasn't. And even then, some dancing fools in slick shoes got to imagine it first. The one I think about the most is the ninth. The ninth black astronaut to attempt a journey into space was Michael P. Anderson, the son of an Air Force serviceman who was one of four black students in his high school graduating class. After logging over 3,000 3, hours of flight time in the Air Force, NASA selected him for astronaut training in 1994. He logged most hours for NASA on the space shuttle Endeavor, delivering goods to other astronauts on missions. Then he was assigned to the space shuttle Columbia. What has always made me uneasy about flying is that aircrafts of all sorts are faulty machines. It is often just the one thing, a bird slipping into an engine or a small part flinging off the side of a vessel's exterior. I imagine there's too much distance between myself and the ground to give myself entirely over to the mercy of machinery, even though disasters have proven to be rare. With space shuttles, it is truly just the one thing, something not applied correctly or shift in weather. The Columbia Space Shuttle launched on January 16, 2003 to prevent ice from getting into the fuel tank. The shuttle's main tank was covered in, isola in, in insulating foam. During the launch, a small piece of the foam broke off, striking the edge of the shuttle's left wing and leaving a small hole. NASA scientists didn't notice the hole as the shuttle pushed towards space. The impact of the foam's damage is noticeable in launch videos. While the astronauts arrived safely, they urged NASA engineers 
engineers to examine the wing and the potential damage the hole could cause. Engineers insisted that foam strikes were common and the harm caused by them was minuscule. In the NASA report that details the crew's final living moments, it says that upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, superheated gases cut through the hole in the wing. The crew module was depressurized and the shuttle went into a violent spin before some of the astronauts could get their suits and helmets back on. All seven of them were unconscious almost instantly. Their bodies flailed around violently. The ones who did get their helmets on had their heads crushed by the force shrinking the helmets around their heads. The shuttle disintegrated and the bodies along with it. Debris stretched from Texas to Louisiana. A wheel here or a cluster of metal there. Black grass Black grass puffed out smoke for days after the flaming pieces landed on it. No bodies were recovered because there were no whole bodies. Farmers in Texas reported watching the bright blur drift across the sky and explode, only to find body parts raining down on them minutes later, an arm or a foot. The stories became more and more sensational as the days wore on. One farmer reported finding a human heart detached from any evidence of an interior. NASA insisted that there was nothing they could have done. Sometimes they said, it is just the one thing. And I say all of this to say the photo I recall most is the one of Michael P. Anderson's mother at his funeral in Arlington. There was, of course, a large picture of him on stage, smiling in his blue suit in front of an American flag. The photo was positioned next to a casket that had no body inside of it. In the photo I remember, his mother has her hands outstretched wide, pulling at the picture as if she's trying to drag her son back down to earth and into the living world. When the internet wanted me to believe that Trayvon Martin deserved to die, I was shown photos that were sometimes him and sometimes not. Photos of black boys shirtless and raising middle fingers or photos of black boys posing with weapons or a black boy blowing smoke into a camera. The idea was that they all deserve to die, I guess. If enough of them blur into the other one, a single bullet could do the trick. To combat this, people began to circulate an image of a younger Trayvon Martin at Experience Aviation in Florida from 2009, just three years before he was murdered. In the photo, Martin is adorned in a replica of the blue uniform that Michael P. Anderson wore in his official NASA photo, the same one all astronauts wear. A rectangle with his name on it is stitched into the chest above a logo, the Earth with wings. And the fundamental flaw, of course, is in this, proving to the public that someone did not deserve to die or did not deserve the violence that chased them down. It is the worst instinct and one that I fight against often when I want to clear the name of someone dead who lived a life that was undoubtedly good and sometimes bad, but always a life nonetheless. And still, there is something particularly cherished about this photo. On Trayvon Martin's birthday every year, people circulate it time and time again. There is the idea that if Martin were still alive, he could have been a person who watched the skies and sought to climb into them, a person who looked down on the earth from somewhere above it and pointed to the state where he grew up, or he might have done none of that at all. He might have gone to college and dropped out, or he might have never gone to college. He might have smoked and played video games well into his 20s, working some job he hated, but he would have been alive to do it all or not do it all. The whole thing with the Trayvon Martin experience aviation photo is that to see him like this, in contrast with seeing him only as a dead problem child child was to see that he was once perhaps someone who saw some promise and possibility in a world that would kill him and demand he deserved to die. His mother, Sabrina Fulton, gently wiped tears from her eyes at his funeral with a white handkerchief. America praised her for her restraint. The easy thing is to say that there are times being black in America has made me feel like I want a different world of my own. When the planet inevitably begins to drown itself and becomes unlivable, I might not be alive anymore. Some people might go to Mars, but I don't think many of my people will go there. My friend listens to the new Janelle Monet album and tells me this is what the future sounds like. And I do think that is true, though it assumes we'll all be living and I don't want to get my hopes up. Still, there's a reason for this, this reckless and gasping pursuit of a world beyond this world, a planet that is freer, or a dance move that mimics a space most of us will never get to. I am interested in what it feels like to imagine yourself as large and immovable as the sky. I have tried to love the unreliable moon through its shifting and through the clouds drinking their way over it. This hasn't worked for me. 
I don't want to go to the moon, but I do want to go to the place where black dreamers stare at the moon and remark loudly about signs and stars in a summer that feels as endless as those old summers, which pulled me from the paltry responsibilities of youth, the planet within the planet. People dance in space suits and young black boys fire rockets above the trees and they always come back down in one piece. Meet me in the darkness of the next eclipse and we'll see how wide we can stretch our new world. Thank you.